things that I actually advise people on when they get no. For me, no is the start of the negotiation, not the end. Mm -hmm. So when I get a no, one of the first questions I ask is, how could you? Under what, like they say, we can't do that. Well, under what circumstances could you do that? What would need to change? Hypothetically speaking, if you could wave a magic wand, what would go away to make that happen? But now we're speaking into reality, something that actually could happen. And we may actually be uncovering really great solutions for the both of us by just removing some of the obstacles. And so it can be a very productive conversation. It doesn't have to be manipulative. It doesn't have to be malicious in any way. That's certainly one of the major strategies that is used on a regular basis. The other thing that I think is very, very common is just asking questions. So understanding what is the why behind this individual's words? What are What is their purpose for being here today? Why is it that they're trying to understand, like that they want this from you? There's a reason why they're giving you the time of day. There's a, like, I mean, I talk to folks who are like, oh, I deal with the largest global retailer on the planet. And, you know, they tell me they barely have any time for you. I'm like, well, they, if they barely have any time and yet they're still creating time in their schedule, they need you for a reason. There's something that they need from you. So taking the time to reflect on that and being able to, to package it back out to them is another way that you need to make sure that you get people on board. So starting with a really great why. I use an example often where I used to negotiate with Walmart buyers in the cosmetics department when I worked for L'Oreal a zillion years ago. And I could say, hey, I need you to buy a million units of this new mascara. And they could go, oh, you're, you're so greedy. What? All of you come in here asking me for all of this stuff. You think I have these endless budgets. But what if I thought about it from her perspective? What if I went, hey, I have a way for you to increase your entire cosmetic department sales. Now she'd be going, okay, tell me a little bit more. So I have this product that when people buy it, they buy 10 other products that have nothing to do with, with my company, but they're going to make your entire cosmetic department sales go up. Okay. Tell me more about it. Well, this product was created for 24 to 35 year olds, the same people who are walking down your aisle, your target market. Okay. Now you've really got me interested, Fotini. You're telling me it's created something for you, for my target market. You're going to increase my entire cosmetic department sales. You're thinking about things from my perspective. Well, now I want to know more about it. And now I can say, okay, here's how you do it. All you need to do is buy a million units of this mascara and people will be buying eye makeup remover and cotton pads and all these other things that I don't get, that I don't benefit from, but certainly you do. Now we can have a conversation about it. Maybe it won't be a million. Maybe it'll be a little less or a little more, but I got her head nodding instead of going, here's what I need to get out of this. When you go in there greedy and they, all they hear is I want, I want, I want, they go, whatever. I don't want to hear from you because that's just greedy. So you've got to be able to frame things from the other party's perspective. It's how do you not balance that? Perspective. How do you balance that with the risk of coming off as salesy? Because there are the, you know, the, the worst manipulators also know that trick. Right. And I, I would imagine, you know, that th there's a, there's a fine line between manipulation and uh, leadership and Someone who's manipulative is going to say, oh, well, I'll just tell Fatina whatever she wants to hear. That way she can help me. So how do you balance that without coming across as manipulative? And I guess this kind of references what we were talking about earlier, which is someone who's not manipulative is probably going to not come off that way anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, sincerity is the number one answer to that because people can often see through those types of things. So if you are trying to convince me of something that I know to not be true, if you're trying to convince me that my entire cosmetic department sales are going to go up, even though I know they won't, or I've had experience in this arena, you can't put a, a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. And also it goes back to that trust arrives on foot. So are is this the first time we're meeting and you think you know me? I don't think so. But if this is the first time we're meeting and you've spent a a little bit of time asking me a little bit more about my business and learning a little bit more about me and sharing some information that might be valuable to me before you go into launching into this negotiation. That's a different story. And so, you know, I remember when I moved from cosmetics into food, for example, whole different set of buyers, people who didn't know me from, from Adam. So I now had to build trust from scratch. My very first meeting with a brand new national Walmart buyer. And I went, I'd like to know a little bit more about you and I've got some information to share with you. And, um, and I, I had asked her a question at some point and I said, Oh, I didn't want to interrupt you. Did you have something to ask? She goes, no, she goes, you're never going to know anything about me. I was like, okay. 
And I just spent a little bit more time asking some questions. I heard her sneezing. Oh, I have allergies too. Do you, are you suffering from allergies? I have allergies to cats. We started talking about her cats. We started getting to know one <laughs> another. I ended up getting, by the time I got back to my office, an hour commute back to the office, I had an email from her going, Fotini, I wish every uh, person I dealt with was as prepared as you are. It was such a great meeting. I look forward to working with you. And my peers were like, what kind of a spell did you cast on this woman? <laughs> and I said, I just an interest in her. Yeah. I asked her some personal questions. And there's science to back that up too. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Robert Cialdini. He's like the godfather of all things persuasion. Yeah. He's written a bunch of very successful books on the subject. But he's done some really interesting studies too that focus on if you build some likability first, because the temptation is let's get down to business right away, especially now in this Zoom world where we are now conditioned to go, okay, the camera's on, let's get down to business before I have to get into my next meeting. In the real world, in the live world, you know, we spend some time shaking hands, we might grab a coffee and so on. But when there's none of, none of those frills in this Zoom room, well, now all of a sudden we're tempted to get down to business right away. Spend a few minutes just saying, hi, how was the weekend? What do you think of this crazy winter weather? You know, just a little bit of get to know you stuff goes a really long way in building that little bit of rapport and trust. It doesn't have to take years. It, you yeah. can maximize the minutes that you have with folks. You know, I saw Sean one time pull off a, a pretty smooth negotiation trick. We were he went with me to go buy um, a truck and, you know, I, I must have been, I guess I was in high school and we're at the dealership and um, they've kind of presented their final offer, right? And they slide it over on a piece of paper. And before we had even walked in, he had said to me, Hey, I know you're buying this, but just let me handle it. I was like, all right, I, I trust you here. And so they slide it over to him. And I don't remember what the dollar amount was, you know, but I, I knew I could afford it and I would have just said yes. And instead he stares <laughs> for an uncomfortably long time at the piece of paper. <laughs> and I'm sitting there everything I can to not ignore what he told me in the parking lot, which was to just let him handle it. And I wanted to just stop and say, dad, okay, we'll, we'll take it, you know, thinking that they're going to not sell us the truck if we ask for too much or something like that. And finally, after what was like, felt like, you know, five full minutes of silence, the salesman, you know, all right, how about we give you a thousand bucks off? And he goes, okay. <laughs> what? It was that easy? <laughs> that was it? He didn't even ask. He didn't even ask. It was amazing. So a couple of years ago, I was going to do the same thing. I'm like, obviously now one time watching one car purchase, I'm an expert. So I go to sell and I think it was maybe, it was either that truck or like the very next car that I bought. I was going to go sell it. And I went into the dealership and I knew that they were going to offer me a, a price. And, and I knew that it wasn't going to be super high because if, if I want to get the best price, I got to sell it private party. I just didn't want to mess with all that. So I go into the dealership. I'm not even looking to buy a car. I'm just looking to sell this vehicle. And I go in, I say, hey man, this is the car that I have. And I think that the value was somewhere around fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000, something like that. Kelly Blue Book, like if I had sold it to a private party. So I know I'm not going to get that much, but I'm thinking, you know, a little bit less than that. Maybe, you know, 13, 12, I don't know, somewhere in that range. And the guy asked me all the questions and he slides me the piece of paper. And I involuntarily adhered to this trick that my dad had showed me. Because it was $8,000. <laughs> I was actually genuinely shocked and mad. And I just stared at it. And I stuck with it, right? It got super uncomfortable. And nobody was saying anything. And I was like, all right, well, you know, maybe I can get 9000 if I just don't say anything. You know, I'll just. And finally, after way too long, the guy goes, is there something, something you have a question on? And I go, nope. And it stays quiet again. And then he asked me, uh, so, so what do you want to do? And I said, you know, in my head, I'm like, well, this was not how this was supposed to go. You were supposed to immediately give me more money. Um, <laughs> so I don't really know what to say here. And I, I just said, well, you know, is this the best you can do? Or something like that. And he goes, uh, yeah, man, this is CarMax. And, <laughs> and I didn't know that they didn't negotiate. <laughs> So I looked like such an idiot. <laughs> but then I made up for it when I bought my house. 
I bra- I this is like the only like good negotiation I can hang my hat on ever. So I learned from what my, you know, dad did when he bought that car. He was like, I want to be the least committed person to getting this deal done. Because if I'm the least desperate person to getting this deal done, which he was perfect yeah. for in that role, because he wasn't even buying it, right? He didn't even care. If I'm the least committed person, then I'm willing to walk away. And if I'm willing to walk away, then I'm not going to accept a bad deal, right? right. Which I thought was really smart. So when I went to go buy my house, I was like, well, this is a, you know, probably the second most significant financial transaction between per- besides purchasing a business that I've ever made. So I need to be willing to walk away. And everything in that whole process, I realized every single other person was desperate to get it done, right? The real estate agent, the title company, the lender, the seller, they all wanted to get it done. And I realized, oh man, like they think I also am desperate to get it done. So they keep coming just like anyone who's bought a house with all of these demands or, you know, anytime I asked for a price reduction, my real estate agent was like, oh no, don't do that. They might pull the offer. So when it started, you know, he was like, well, I, you know, they have it listed for this. So I think you should offer that. And I went, I'm not going to offer what it's listed for. He goes, well, you know, in this environment. And I said, nah, offer 10% less. And he was like, I don't recommend that. I said, I don't really care because if I don't buy it, who cares? And he offers it and they come back and they meet me in the middle. And I go, see, I just got 5% for free. No, thanks to you. And then um, they go to like, you know, do the inspection. Right. And I said, oh, well, I want another, you know, 5% off. And at that point, I guess I pushed them too far. They were like, oh, no, we got, you know, 50 new offers waiting, you know, everybody and their mother wants to buy this house. So we're not going, you know, we're not going to budge at all. And I was like, all right, whatever. I, I will, you know, I'll take a little bit less. My real estate agent goes, what's the like lease you'd take? I said, oh, you know, 4% off or whatever. And he goes, man, I don't think that's a good idea. If they say no, the deal's done. You know, you lose, you know, your whatever Four hundred dollar deposit or a home inspection, whatever. So who cares? You know, four hundred bucks. If you're gonna be this way and I'm gonna do a bad deal, that's nothing in the grand scheme of things. Sure enough, they kill it. A month and a half later, they call me back, or my real estate agent calls me back and he says, "Hey, um, so they're gonna offer you literally everything that you asked for in the first place, and they're gonna fix the things that are on the inspection that you were that were wrong." So they're going to give you more than you even wanted. And he goes, but the key is uh, they need to know by today. So I hung up and I waited till tomorrow just to be petty. And I said, I'll do it. (laughs) And nothing has made me feel like more powerful than that moment in my life. Well, I mean, you've just demonstrated why one of the many reasons why I've called my book, Say Less, Get More. So it's like that quiet, right? That that I'm not eager. I'm not jumping on this in this second. Um, that that demonstrates power, right? The fact that you are you now are giving the perception that I can afford to walk away. I'm not eager, desperate, you know, talking myself out of a deal because that's another really big one. You know, Sean demonstrated that in the first example. He just sat there quietly and then they offer another thousand bucks. But the temptation for everybody is I need to say something. Yeah. I need to fill this void. And you know what you end up filling it with? Money that is coming out of your pockets. That's usually how these things go down. Um, I would say one of the other things that it brings to mind is, you know, Sean, you asked about some of the other tactics or, or strategies in negotiation. And this one, it's it's controversial for a bit of a strange reason. There's one book I can think of that that defies this, but the the conventional wisdom, the science, the you know every other negotiation book that I've ever read says the person who goes first gets the best deal. And so being able to go in, if you had gone in with your truck scenario and said, hey, I need 15,000 or 16,000 for this, and then been quiet, they would have been like, how do I get close to 16,000? How do I get them away from that 16,000? What happens is you've now anchored the number 16,000. That's the number that we're dancing around. And so what happens is if you can think of an anchor on a boat, when you drop an anchor, the anchor will keep the boat from drifting very far. We're going to stay in the vicinity yeah. of this anchor. 
And so being able to do that and then be quiet and not talk yourself out of it, they're going to start making offers to get closer and closer to that. So when you anchored in the house scenario, here's what I want. I want that 10% less. Now and then you're being quiet, and they're going, "Well, how do I how do I get them back to this?" Well, I'm going to throw in even the repairs on top of this other thing. Um, you know, those are the types of things that work for us because we're planting messages on people's subconscious all the time, as well as our own. So if you allow them to get in your head and go, 